The programme you've just seen will be discussed in the next radio programme for the People and Work course on Thursday the 17th of September at 25 to 7 in the morning on Radio 3 VHF. Now here's the second programme about colour television for students of the third level and associate studies course telecommunication systems. It's introduced by Gabby Small of the Open University. This is the RF spectrum of a television signal and this is a vision carrier. It's six megahertz below the sound carrier. Most of the spectrum consists of luminance information but the amplitude of the luminance signal drops off at higher frequencies. And this is where the chrominance information is inserted. The chrominance of color subcarrier is here. It's 4.43 megahertz above the vision carrier. In the previous program, we saw that spurious phase changes of the chrominance signal due to differential phase distortion could produce objectionable changes of hue in the NTSC system. In this program, we'll look at the power system, which was designed to overcome this difficulty. This is a phaser one might get from the modulated chrominance signal corresponding to part of a human face. The hue is red and the color appears pink because the saturation is less than maximum. A phase shift due to distortion might rotate the phaser anti-clockwise like this, towards yellow. In the NTSC system, this would turn pink faces into yellow ones. What the power system does is to code the color signal before it's transmitted and decode it in the receiver. The type of coding used is to invert the V component of the phasers on every alternative line, hence the name PAL, which stands for phase alternation by line. On a phaser diagram, this means that any phaser is replaced on alternate lines by a new phaser equal to the previous one reflected in the horizontal axis. So for one line, a red signal is transmitted as the upper phaser, on the next line as the lower phaser, and so on. In receivers, the reflection of alternate lines is reversed and a special circuit reconstitutes the signal. How does this help to get around the problem of phase distortion? Let's see what effect phase distortion has on the transmitted signal. This is a signal corresponding to a red picture as it is transmitted. Now suppose that a phase shift occurs in transmission. The phases will both be rotated so that the received signal does not correspond to the transmitted signal. Now what happens when the signal is received? In the receiver, the line reflection is reversed. But see what effect the phase shift has had. The transmitted phaser is shown dashed. In the receiver, there are two phasers alternating at line frequency. The phase shift in the transmission path has caused the phasers for alternate lines to be shifted in opposite directions after reflection in the receiver. Inside the receiver, there's a circuit which combines two successive lines. With no phase shift on transmission, we would get a phaser which is twice the length of the transmitted one. But, because of phase shift, as we can see from the parallelogram rule, the recombined phaser is shorter, but it's still in the same direction as the transmitted one. In other words, the phase shift doesn't change the hue of the picture, but it does reduce the saturation. So the result of line alternation is to reduce the effects of phase errors by turning hue errors into reduced saturation, which is less noticeable. Let's see how this works out in practice. This time I'll rotate the phases clockwise. This is a uniform red picture, and here's the corresponding phaser for NTSC. This is a tip of the phaser. The origin of the phaser is at the center of the picture. Any phase change causes an error in the hue of the color, in this case towards blue. Now, I'll remove the phase change and switch over to PAL. This time, we have two vectors, the original one, again, it's origin at the center, and this one reflected, also it's origin at the center. 
These are the two PAL vectors. And now let's see what happens when we introduce the same phase change. The picture this time, instead of turning blue, goes pink. This is because in the receiver, alternate lines are reversed. And they're combined. This gives a phase corresponding to red, but with reduced saturation. That's the principle of the PAL technique, which prevents distortion from affecting the hue of color at the receiver. We'll now see how it's done in practice. This is a very much simplified block diagram of the relevant parts of a receiver. The appropriate RF channel is selected by the tuner. The signal is frequency shifted down to IF, where it is amplified. It then goes to detectors, which produce various outputs for the luminance, synchronization, and sound circuits. These circuits aren't shown in the diagram because we're only interested in the chrominance just now. A video signal is taken from the detectors through a filter, passing signals in a band of about 1.3 megahertz on either side of the chrominance subcarrier frequency of 4.43 megahertz. This filter extracts the modulated chrominance signal, which goes on to the chrominance demodulators, whose output is the color difference signal. They are combined with the luminance signal in the matrix to give green, red, and blue signals for the three guns of the picture tube. We'll be concentrating on the chrominance demodulator. But first, I want to remind you of a convenient way of representing chrominance phases. Imagine this is a chrominance phaser at subcarrier frequency, representing the signal for a patch of uniform color in the picture. It has components U and V. The phase difference between U and V is 90 degrees. So we can use an Argand diagram with U along the real axis and V along the imaginary axis. We can then express our signal phaser as U plus JV. Reversing the V components gives U minus JV. So with a PAL system, if the modulated chrominance signal is represented as U plus JV for one line, it will be U minus JV for the next. Now let's see how these two signals are handled in a PAL receiver. This is the circuit which combines signals for two consecutive lines before demodulation. A piezoelectric delay line produces a 64 microsecond delay, which is equal to exactly one line period. So the output of the delay circuit is the same as its input was exactly one line period before. The input to the circuit alternates between U plus JV one line period and U minus JV the next. What happens when the input is U plus JV will be shown above the various lines in the diagram. And what happens when the input is U minus JV will be shown below them. Let's start by looking above the lines. That is for the case where the input is U plus JV. The output of the delay circuit is then U minus JV, corresponding to the previous line. These two signals are combined by addition and subtraction. Let's look at the addition first. There's a direct input U plus JV to the adder, and the delay circuit gives U minus JV. The sum of these two is simply 2U. The next line period, the direct input is U minus JV, but the delay circuit now produces U plus JV. The sum of these two is once again 2U. Now let's look at the subtraction circuit. If the direct input is U plus JV, the delayed output U minus JV is subtracted from this to give 2JV. If the direct input is U minus JV, subtracting the delayed output, which is now U plus JV, gives minus 2JV. So the subtractor output changes from one line to the next, whereas the adder output doesn't. These two signals are taken to synchronous demodulators. But first, David will have a look at the signals I've just been talking about in an actual receiver. Well, this is the receiver we're going to use. It's been loaned to us by the uh, Wilsdon College of Technology. It's a special demonstration set. 
and we're using it in conjunction with a, a sort of pseudo transmitter this signal generator here which produces a modulated carrier at UHF and we're feeding that down into the aerial socket of the receiver now at the moment as you can see we're producing a crosshatch pattern I can punch up a, a checkerboard or a completely red field and that's what I'm going to use for the rest of this demonstration the whole picture is red now if you look at the oscilloscope you can see two traces the lower one is a continuous sine wave which is the uh, color subcarrier reference output from our transmitter directly from the signal generator the upper one is the chrominance signal coming into the circuits that Gabby was talking about for a red picture there is the uh, color burst and there is the color burst for the next line in between here we have a fixed frequency sinusoid at the uh, color subcarrier frequency but of course with a relative phase shift and again on the next line now we can in fact display this waveform on an expanded time base simply by uh, switching the oscilloscope and it will show us uh, this bright up area here which I can adjust through one line to the next like that now if I switch the oscilloscope the trace goes rather dim so what I've done is to take some photographs the first one is this one this is a photograph of the expanded trace I'll just explain on the lower trace we have the reference oscillation from the transmitter you'll notice that I've aligned that so that this peak is in the center of the graticle and we can compare that with the phase of the red chrominant signal on the upper trace notice that that's leading by about 90 degrees now let's look at another photograph now th this second one is taken on the next line again we have the reference signal on the bottom and this time notice that the red chrominant signal is lagging the reference by about 90 degrees so as Gabby said we get a, a phase alternation from one line to the next well that's what happens to the chrominance signal coming in in this particular case a red signal now let's look at the output of the um, adder and the subtractor if I switch the oscilloscope display I'll take away that um, chrominance input signal and now you can see on the upper trace which I'll move slightly the signal we're looking at now is the output from the adder that's the 2U signal that Gabby talked about again I can select the signal in, in the first line or we can go to the second line and I've taken some similar photographs of this situation the first one is for the first line of the display again the lower trace is the reference oscillator from the transmitter and the upper trace is the 2U output and you'll notice that it's practically in phase amplitude is rather small because for a red signal the U is very much smaller than the V signal the, the next photograph um, is the one for the same waveform but on the next line in this case again we have the reference oscillator and again the 2U output which is practically in phase as we'd expect because as Gabby has explained the U signal doesn't change phase from one line to the next now let's look at the V output from the subtractor rather the 2V output from the subtractor if you look at the oscilloscope again I'll switch over from U to V and that's the signal somewhat bigger because with the red signal we have a bigger V signal again the photograph I'm going to show you is taken from the first line here it is lower trace is again the reference oscillator and here's the 2V output which is leading the reference by approximately 90 degrees and the next photograph the same signal again from the uh, subtractor output the 2V but on the next line and now you can see compared with the reference here that this is lagging by about 90 degrees so the 2V output from the subtractor switches from the phase which it was in in that line to this line and back again alternately as we'd expect in the PAL system well those are the signals first of all the chrominance input the first one I showed you for the red signal we're talking about 
the 2U output from the adder and the 2V output from the subtractor. Now, what about demodulating these signals? So we have two inputs for the next part of the circuit. 2U is one of them, the other is plus 2JV one line and minus 2JV the next. The J simply means that there's a 90 degree phase difference between the U and V signals, which, for a uniform color patch, are sinusoids at subcarrier frequency. Let's see what happens to the two inputs. They go to synchronous demodulators. The reference carriers for the two demodulators must be in the right phases for the U and V signals. And this is what complicates the circuit. First, there's a 90 degrees phase difference between the two. That's looked after by a 90 degree phase shift along the path of the U reference subcarrier. But there's also a factor plus or minus in the case of the V signal. This is taken care of by inverting the V subcarrier that is changing its phase by 180 degrees on alternate lines by means of an electronic switch. The control signal for the switch can be derived from sync pulses. A complete switch cycle takes two line periods. The reference, reference subcarrier is sent along the direct path for one line and via the 180 degree inverting circuit for the next. The reference subcarrier is produced by an oscillator which must be locked in frequency and phase to the transmitted subcarrier. This is done by means of the color burst, which is a burst of about 10 cycles of color subcarrier transmitted once per line just after the sync pulse. The video signal which contains the color burst is applied to the burst gate. This is an electronic switch operated by a control signal timed so that the switch opens just after each sync pulse and stays open just only long enough to let the color burst through. The burst of transmitted subcarrier is therefore applied once per line to the reference subcarrier oscillator and this is enough to ensure that it's locked to the burst both in frequency and phase. Now let's have a look at the signals involved in this process. Well if we look at the oscilloscope again we can see some of the waveforms involved. In this particular case, I switch from a red signal to a, an all-white picture. And this top line is showing the actual video signal generated at the transmitter. You can see a sync pulse there, the color burst, and then a constant luminous level for our white picture. Now below that, this is a waveform in the receiver. This is the burst gate input pulse. It's derived from the line flyback. You get this little sinusoidal pulse there. And when that goes negative, it opens the gate and lets through the burst. And this, in fact, is the output from the burst gate. This signal here is the burst from the burst gate. The little thing that precedes it is uh, a bit of oscillation in the filter caused by the leading edge of the sync pulse, which occurs there. But that turns out to be a different frequency, so it doesn't affect the oscillator, in fact. So coming back to the burst, which actually comes out of the gate, that is applied to the reference oscillator within the receiver and this is the output of that oscillator it's a continuous sine wave and just as we did in the previous cases uh, I'm going to look at a photograph of that on an expanded time base so here's the photograph now once again the lower trace is the reference oscillator within the signal generator or, or the transmitter and the upper trace in this case is the reference oscillator within the receiver which is triggered by the burst gate as we just saw. You can see what its phase is, it's something like 90 degrees uh, behind the reference oscillator in the transmitter. Now that's on one line. The next photograph I'm going to show you is on the next line. Here again is the reference oscillator in the signal generator and here's the reference oscillator in the receiver. It looks just like the other picture. As we would expect, the reference oscillator in the receiver is kept in phase from line to line, um, just as we require. Well, having looked at that, we now want to look at the U and V reference oscillators, which are used to drive the demodulator circuits. So, let's look at the oscilloscope again. Well, I've now switched the oscilloscope to display three waveforms. 
The top one is the reference oscillator within the receiver, the one we were just looking at. And the next one is the U reference. That's one of the inputs to the demodulator. And the lower one is the V reference, the other uh, input to the demodulators. Now, once again, I've taken some photographs. I'll show you the first one. In this particular case, the top trace is the reference oscillator within the receiver. That's the one that's triggered by the burst gate and runs with a constant phase all the time. Below that is the U reference oscillator. Now let's note the phase of that. Uh, taking that peak as our reference, notice that the U reference um, is on a zero crossing there, so it's leading it by about 90 degrees. Okay, that's the U reference. Now the next photograph, which is this one, again shows the U reference oscillator on the lower trace. On the upper trace, I have the V reference oscillator. So comparing the V with the U, there's a zero crossing there. The V is leading, because it's coming sooner in time, the V is leading on the U by about 90 degrees. Now that's on one line. So now let's look at the next line. That's in my last photograph, which is this one. Again, we have our U reference on the lower trace located in the same place as before. Now, our V reference, which is on the top, is lagging behind the U by about 90. So whereas in the previous line, we had the V reference oscillator peak about there, 90 degrees ahead, now it's 90 degrees behind. So, as Gabby was explaining, the V reference oscillator changes phase from line to line, but the U reference, which is this one, stays in the same phase all the time. So now we've seen the U and V reference oscillator signals. The U which is of constant phase and the V which changes phase on alternate lines. And these are fed to the two demodulators. One of which takes the output from the adder, the 2U signal, and the other one takes the output from the subtractor, the 2V signal. And out of the two modulators we finally get the demodulated colour signal. Well that's how demodulation is carried out in the power system. The signals then go to the matrix and onto the guns, and that's the end of the process. It's also the end of our programs on television systems, in which we've had a go at demonstrating just a few of the many, I think fascinating, aspects of television. There's another chance to hit...